This is a podcast in five parts, each part a piece of the Pentateuch. And uh, this is a basic introduction to the very beginning of the Old Testament as a part of the basic Bible class. The year is about 1500 BC, and the place is the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula between present day Egypt and present day Israel. A man has been herding sheep and goats out there in the wilderness, and suddenly he sees something that catches his attention. A bush is burning, but it isn't being burned up. And so he goes over to see what it's all about, and he hears a voice saying to him, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place whereon you are standing is holy ground. And the man, whose name is Moses, and who's about 40 years old, does just that, removes his sandals from his feet, and engages in an encounter with the God of his ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's been hundreds of years since God made his compact, his contract, his covenant, his agreement with Father Abraham, and the descendants of Abraham, his son Isaac, his grandson Jacob, and their sons have been in Egyptian slavery for a long time. And in this moment at the burning bush, Moses meets Yahweh, the name Y-H-W-H is the closest we can come to the actual name of God as it's told to us in the Hebrew Old Testament. This is probably a form of the Hebrew verb to be and is often translated I am or I am because I am and usually pronounced Yahweh although it's not necessarily the case that that's the pronunciation because the ancient Hebrew had no vowels in it only consonants. God says to Moses, I want you to go down to Egypt. I want you to tell Pharaoh, the king there, to let my people go. And after a lot of convincing, and we'll go into that more in the book of Exodus, Pharaoh does in fact allow the Israelites to leave Egypt. And Moses leads them out of Egypt to the borders of Canaan, also known as Israel, also known as Palestine, a.k.a. the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, and so on. The whole process of the Exodus and the trip to Israel takes about 40 years, not because it was that far away, but because the people weren't ready to go in and conquer the land. During this time, Moses writes what we have come to know as the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch comes from two Greek words, penta meaning five and tuch meaning book, and literally means five books, and the five books are now known today as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These five books make up the first five books of the Jewish and Christian Bible, and have generally been ascribed to the authorship of the man Moses. We're going to take a look at the first one in this podcast, the book of Genesis. Genesis is actually a prequel to Exodus. Uh, You're familiar with the prequel idea from Star Wars and things like that. Moses actually starts out in the middle of the book of Exodus. And um, he uh, decides to add, at some point later, the book of Genesis as a way of introducing the storyline in the book of Exodus. He realizes that the story isn't told very clearly without that. And so he adds that piece to it. And... um, gives us the beginning of the story. Genesis, in fact, comes from a Greek word that means beginnings. And in Genesis, we see the beginning of the world. God creates everything. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The beginning of life, human life and non-human life. The beginning, of course, of human beings, a man and a woman. And uh, the beginning of the family. And uh, that whole institution that we call home and marriage and family. Also, unfortunately, Genesis tells us the story of the beginning of sin, something that God didn't intend should be there at all, ever, but which shows up fairly soon after there are human beings, something goes wrong and sin comes into the story. And along with sin, of course, comes its partner, death. 
This is a description of the beginnings of human brokenness, the brokenness of the human being, the brokenness of the human family, the brokenness of human society, human economics, human politics, human government, the brokenness of the world, the brokenness that constitutes the brokenness of all reality that we see. It also, fortunately, tells us the beginning of something else, and that's the beginning of the salvation story. Salvation is just a theological word that literally means rescue, like you would rescue somebody from a burning building or somebody from drowning. That would be salvation, and that's exactly the way Genesis understands the issue of human beings who are in trouble and need to be rescued. We're going to take a look at a couple of outstanding chapters in the book of Genesis. The first one, chapter 3. It is in chapter 3 that Moses tells the story of the fall. In chapters 1 and 2, he's told the creation story. In chapter 3, he tells how human beings took the amazing gifts that God had built into them at creation and used those amazing gifts to exercise the freedom of will that God had given to them in the wrong direction, in a direction of disobedience and rebellion against God and self-centeredness and uh, independence, and the result was what the theologians call the fall, the fall of the world, the fall of humanity, the fall of everything. It explains why the world is the way it is today. It explains why humans are the way they are. It presents the human dilemma. What is the human dilemma? Well, look around at the world, listen to the evening news, walk through a hospital or a nursing home, and you'll know quite a lot about the human dilemma. The way things are, and we all know that that's not the way that they ought to be. Also, Genesis 3 introduces the idea of salvation, that rescue thing again, and it introduces the rescuer, not by the name of Jesus, but rather by hinting that he is, in fact, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. In Genesis 3 and verse 15, God says to the serpent, who is clearly a figure for the devil and Satan, the adversary, that uh, someone who is born of the seed of the woman would come into the world and he shall bruise or crush the head of the serpent. And in the process, the serpent will strike his heel and bruise it, injure it. And this is uh, the first prophecy in the Bible, in Genesis 3.15, of what Jesus would do when he comes into the world. He will crush the head of the enemy, Satan. But in the process, he himself will be badly wounded. In Genesis chapter 6, we have a different uh, story, the story of the flood. Now, in between chapters 3 and chapter 6, of course, you've got chapters 4 and 5, which simply tells the story of how the human family very quickly, after sin came into the world, began to sink into the mud of sin and rebellion and evil and all kinds of unspeakable wickedness. Corruption is increasing so rapidly that it's hard to believe Uh, the depths of wickedness that human beings are capable of. And God demonstrates that he knows at least one way to restrain the growth of evil, and that is to eliminate evil by eliminating evildoers. And what happens, of course, is that God uh, eliminates all the evildoers who refuse to enter into his salvation and saves all the good ones. There happen to be eight of them, just eight, Noah and his family. Uh, All the rest refuse to come into the ark, even though they're invited. You know, people sometimes say Christianity is very narrow and God's very judgmental and cruel, but he invites everybody to come in. But he knows ahead of time, of course, that uh, only eight will accept his invitation. And these eight are saved and all the rest are lost in the flood. This, of course, is a prefiguring of Jesus, who is the ark, who is uh, able to rescue those who will come to him, but who can do nothing for those who refuse to come. And um, this flood story becomes very prominent also uh, throughout the Bible. So you've got the story of the fall and the hintings of redemption through a substitute in Genesis 3, and then you've got the story of the flood and uh, the offer of redemption through the ark, but the refusal of redemption on the part of most people, and the redemption of only a few in Genesis chapter 6. Now notice the common theme that's emerging from all this is that God has determined that he's going to fix the world. He's going to make it right. In order to do that, he has to eliminate sin because sin is the source of all of our human suffering, of death, of sickness, of crime, of rebellion, of all kinds of terrible things. And so God says, I'm going to get rid of sin, but if you don't let go of it, it's going to get rid of you too. So, you know, be, be set free from this thing. Allow me to set you free from it. In the Genesis 3 story, back in chapter 15, there is an immediate story here about how God clothes the nakedness of the man and the woman with the skins of an animal. 
Now, again, I think this prefigures the death of Jesus, who gives his life in order to cover the wickedness of human beings with his own righteousness. In Genesis 6, you know, God says to Noah, I want you to build an ark, a boat that is big enough to shelter everyone. And again, you know, this is Jesus. Jesus is the boat who is big enough to shelter everyone who wants to be a part of that. Now, then you come to Genesis 12. In Genesis 12, you cross the border from prehistory, where we have no independent verification, no archaeology, no documents, no written records. We cross the border from prehistory into history. Because with Genesis 12, we're now on solid historical ground. We have the story of the, the, of the covenant that God makes with Abram, also known as Abraham. He starts out as Abram. Later, God changes his name to Abraham. And the covenant is uh, that God says to Abraham, Abram, be faithful to me, and I will be faithful to you, and I will bless you. And then God says, and through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. In other words, not only will Abraham be blessed, but he will be a channel of blessing through which the whole world will be blessed if he is faithful. And of course, that means not just him, but his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, his great-great, you know, and so on down the line. Abraham is the first Jew, and Abraham founds the Jewish nation. He is the beginning of Jews. He's the beginning of Judaism. And immediately, God gives Jews, gives Abraham a covenant, a sign of the covenant, and the sign of the covenant is circumcision. Now, it seems a little weird, I know. So hold on here, hang on, because this becomes an important theme later on. The idea is that something very personal, very private will take place that will mark the relationship that God has with human beings and will be a sign that these human beings belong to him, a sign that uh, is very intimate, but which marks them as his own people. And um, later on, um, this will become a huge issue, <clears throat> as we will see when we get more into the New Testament. But at this point, let's just notice that this is a very clear indication that Jews belong to God. Um, the story of the human family from this point on is really the story of Abraham's family because Abraham's family is the channel through which God's grace flows to the world. And, um, and uh, the story of the Old Testament is really the story of how God deals with Abraham's family, the Jews, how he blesses them, how he's faithful to them, how they, on the other hand, are very unfaithful to him and how as a result of their unfaithfulness he's not able to give the kinds of blessings that he wants to give and uh, terrible things happen that he never wanted to have happen which never would have happened if the Jews had been faithful to him instead uh, the blessing of humanity flows into Abraham's family and out of Abraham's family to the rest of the world and one of the very cool things that this is all prefiguring of course is that eventually the promised one the Savior the Messiah will come out of Abraham's family. He will be born in the genealogy of Abraham. He will come into the world and he will bring salvation to every human being who is willing. And uh, that salvation will be complete. At the uh, end of Genesis, uh, Israel, Abraham's family, has been in slavery in Egypt for more than 400 years. Things don't look good. Clearly the deliverers need a deliverer. And this, of course, marks the transition from the book of Genesis into the book of Exodus. As I said, Genesis is prequel. It tells us the storyline behind the story of Exodus and uh, tells us how Israel got into slavery and uh, why it was necessary for Moses to play the part of a deliverer and to go to Pharaoh and say, on God's behalf, let my people go.